The teacher was going out of his mind. Then finally, one night, before the girl hung up, he managed to ask, Who are you? In a weak voice, the girl replied, I'm in your class, teacher. You know me. When the adrenaline finally kicked in, I turned and ran outside my room, flinging the doors open so hard they hit the outside of the building with a bang. The security guard stood up this time. What's wrong? He said. I think there's someone in my room. The mother grabbed a knife and ended up stabbing her husband to death. Gorgeous. No, I love that. Ooh. International Women's Day. Kill the men. Stunning. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to episode, episode 70, 70 of Ghost 70. Huns. Do you know what else is 70 MH370? <laughs> you need of to... Ghost Huns. Because you're going like, to like start collecting... Um... Debris. 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 Like Susie, I'm going on holiday. Where? To the Indian Ocean. <laughs> My mate, Debris. My mate, Debris. <laughs> <laughs> it's every day is a joke, isn't yeah, it? Honestly, Barry, How are and, you? Barry and Debris. How are you? Um, oh my god, do you want right. a bit of silly? Me and Susie just fun? went for a cheeky wine before the pod recording. Cheeky wine? Um, it is 9 a.m., but we did do that anyway. <laughs> and it's International Women's Day, oh, motherfucker. Oh, yeah, we went to go and cheers to women. Um, and Susie was like, I have got gossip because I was like, right, what's your goss? Yeah, get your gossip points out, get your goss and, out. And um, she had nothing for me because she was waiting till now. So, what's yes. your goss? So, I won an Instagram competition. No, yes, what? What do you mean? Yes. What do you mean? So do you ever like at yourself underneath a competition? <laughs> no, because... <laughs> I speak like that. Sorry, I did a cough. Say it again. What? <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? I put um, my... I, I, I added myself underneath Oh, I've never done that, yeah. What, you've never entered an Instagram competition? No. no. Really? Yeah, I thought it was scams, but... Oh my God, what's wrong with you? Well, do you know what? Because I know someone that, I know someone that did this, that raffled off a care package on Facebook and then for this, and did this, it was like, oh, tag yourselves underneath it in the comments. And then was just like, um, oh yeah, so congratulations, Sarah Smith. And they don't exist and just kept doing it over and over again uh -huh. uh, to get people to send her free stuff and she just used it. And they'd enter a competition, they'd like pay for it. Oh, I see. Like a raffle. Oh, so, so what, she she'd get scammed. like scammed. So she'd get companies to give her like gifts to like do a yeah. giveaway. They yeah. think they're getting brand awareness. Yeah, and oh the, and the, and everybody that commented had to pay like a quid. <gasps> oh my god! A bit and like she just O'Maze. did it for ages. Like uh, the Omaze Is Omaze house? a scam? Well, I think it's a big debate, but I um... oh. right. Well, what have you won? Oh, what have you won? God. Uh, okay. Is it a holiday? Can I come? No, I wish it was like a car or a holiday or a house. What is it? It's not. I've got some cookies. <laughs> oh, great. No, I've got cookies. Uh, where are I've they? I've got, um, well, it's all in Putney. So there's this, uh, <laughs> there's this bar class that I go to, Hold Fire. Jesus. Don't take the piss out of me. I, I've gone to a bar class and I really liked it, okay? Mm. What's and a, bar? a bar? Oh, the ballet class. It's like, yeah, it's like, get your leg. Look at that. Mm. Oh, my oh, that's God. Good. Good. That's good. Thank you so much. And um, I went to this bar class in Putney called mm. Barfly London. Right. Check it out. And this yeah. like this fucking great sassy American woman called Ness runs it. And um, anyway, she posted this thing on Instagram, being like, uh, as part of International Women's Day, um, all these women-run businesses are like chucking in all these like things. Right. And one person will win it. And I was like. And I don't usually enter into Instagram yeah. competitions just because I'm like, I never win, whatever. I put my name under. I've got tagged in this reel. It was like, Susie, you legend. You have won. And I've won. Oh, my I've won, God. I've won classes. I've won dinner. I've won, oh, my God. Hannah, I've won a bridal consultation. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait. I can't wait to go. To what's have, what's fucking... the expiry date on this? I know. I was like, I'm, no, I'm going to go immediately with a fucking my, oh, right. my Tinder out and a champagne in one hand. Oh, and be like, yeah, yes, Gloria, yeah. I love sort it. Sort this out, Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you want to fucking consult? Consult on mm. this shit show, mate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, shit show, i.e. <laughs> Susie's love life. <laughs> okay, wow. I'm joking, I'm joking. But I am joking. I don't, I don't mm. like it. Uh, gold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, oh, my God, that's so good. So what's this dinner? 
Well, I don't know. I think it's like sushi and tuna and avocados and oh, stuff. It's very, avocados. it's very like. I do uh, like sushi though. Mm. <laughs> Completely well, no, unrelated. No, but I got my um, I got my other mate Hannah to at herself, and then I said I'd take her if I won. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so. Thank you, Fine. <laughs> and the Battle of the Hannas. <laughs> Not come out too rosy, have I? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, well congratulations on you, your win. Honestly, I'm so I'm so thrilled. Sex, maybe I should start doing things like that. Honestly, you must. I, I just love free things. I, I love little so gifts. So do I. I just can't believe how thrilled I am about it. It's very exciting. I get a hydrofacial. Oh, great. That's I, expensive, isn't yes, it? Yes, mate. Oh, that, you didn't mention that. A fucking hydrofacial. Oh, amazing. Honestly. Like, thank you, Barfly. I want a f- hydrofacial. Oh. How much are they then normally? Well, I think about 120 RRP. Fucking Do you know hell. what I mean? Do you know what I mean? She's going to, you're going to be, you with a cookie in one hand, blowing skin. And yeah, the other. and a wedding dress. <laughs> and a wedding dress. Oh, <laughs> just, my God. Just eating some sushi. We should go to that for a laugh. <laughs> yes. Like, can they do as friends? 100%. If you want to come to my end. bridal oh, consultation. I do. I do. Okay, Hannah, would you like to pick a tarot? Yes, thank you. I want this one. Oh, I don't like this one. We've had it so many times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pentacles. This book is a bit too good for its own liking. Um, what does it what does it look like? Describe what is happening on the front. It's of a it. bloke in a fucking dress. Oh, holding a bird. Yeah. Yes. That. Um. Oh, that's interesting. Well, you said you wanted to, you know, have a pool. Uh, oh, great. It points to a person who is financially secure enough to live comfortably. This is about someone supported by her own business. Fucking hell! And I, oh, I was that's talking a about bit on the nose. International Women's Day. And yeah, I just want all these women the businesses. Fuck, Fuck me. Inher- right. In bone business inheritance or property, this is one person in a thousand. This fortunate individual has one turned... One person in a thousand? Yeah. Fuck. This fortunate individual has turned a historical accident into a personal opportunity. This is one who has the vision and strength of character to hold on to gains against all odds. Do not be fooled at the apparent ease displayed on this card. The person pictured is at the tail end of a long and stressful process of winning the right to be taken seriously. All of this grace has been paid for. Gorgeous. Several times over. Thrilled. Excellente. <laughs> I I couldn't be happy with that, to be honest with you. That's I'm absolutely nice. thrilled. Um, okay, do you want a stirring? Yes, please. We did have last week the Facebook dead girlfriend messages. Yes. We will do that next week because, to be quite honest, I haven't had enough time to research it. So that will be coming. But it will be in the next episode. Okay. Um, so this mess, this story is about, um, it's quite dark. Oh. It's about imaginary friends. Amazing. So that's quite bad. Um, as we've said, we fucking hate that anyway. Okay, you ready? Yes. Such ordinary things make me afraid. Hot sunny days, dark shadows on grass, and children with red hair in the name Harry. Oh. My daughter Christine was five years old. It was a hot sunny day and she was playing alone in the garden. I overheard her talking to somebody. I went outside to see who it was, but there was nobody there. I was puzzled. Who are you talking to? I asked. Harry, she replied. Harry who? I asked. She shrugged her shoulders. Just Harry, she said. Is that a five-year-old's voice? I've got no idea. That evening when my husband came home from work, I told him about it. He said it was normal for kids that age to have imaginary friends. I tried to put it out of my mind, but something about that name, Harry, sent a shiver down my spine. The next day, Christine was playing in the garden again while I was in the kitchen. Again, I heard her talking to someone. When I looked out the window, I thought I could see a dark shadow on the grass. It looked like a person, but maybe it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. I tapped on the window and told Christine to come inside for dinner. Can Harry come too? She asked. No, I said. Harry has to stay outside. But he's hungry, she whined. Who is Harry? I asked. He's my brother, she replied. But you don't have a brother, I told her. Yes, I do. His name's Harry. Who told you that? I asked. Harry told me. I mean, it's just very aggressive, isn't it now? My daughter spent every day in the garden talking to her imaginary friend. After a while, it began to worry me, so I took her to see a psychiatrist. All children need friends their own age, the psychiatrist told me. 
If they don't have friends, they invent them. It's a normal part of childhood. As soon as she starts school, she will forget about it. Talking to the psychiatrist reassured me, but I couldn't help but feeling a little bit nervous. A few days later, Christine started school. I dropped her off in the morning for her first day. I kissed her on the forehead and waved goodbye, then watched as she walked up to the front door of the school and went inside. There was something I had to do. I took a bus into the city and made my way to a large grey building. It had been four long years since I visited here. It was the orphanage where we adopted Christine. The woman who ran the orphanage opened the door. Orphanaged? Orphanage opened the door and invited me inside. I told her I needed to know about Christine's story. Who were her birth parents? Where were they now? Had they died? And if so, how had they died? I'm sorry, the woman said. We have strict rules about divulging such information. I told her it was very important. I begged and pleaded. I even got down on my knees at one point and eventually she gave in. Very well, she said, but this must remain strictly between the two of us. Christine was born into a very poor family. Her parents didn't really want her and they'd neglected their children. The house they lived in was in a terrible condition. One night, the father and mother got into a violent argument. The mother grabbed a knife and ended up stabbing her husband to death. Gorgeous. No, I love that. Ooh. International Women's Day. Kill the men. Stunning. <laughs> when the police arrived, it was all over. They found Christine in the garden, clutched in the arms of her brother. She was unharmed, but her brother had died in the incident. Oh, no. He had been stabbed and was dying, and he managed to grab Christine and take her to safety. They found their father and mother inside, inside the house, and the mother had taken her own life. This is quite dark. Wow. My eyes were welling up with tears. What was his name? Harry. I stumbled out of the orphanage in a daze and I wandered through the streets with no idea of where I was going. The name Harry was floating around in my brain. I felt like I was in a nightmare. I was so frightened, but I didn't know why. Then I looked at my watch. It was after three o'clock. I had to pick Christine up from school and I was already late. I hopped on a bus and eventually I arrived at the school. I walked down the hallway and went into the classroom where I found the teacher gathering up her books. I'm so sorry I'm late, I gasped. Where's Christine? Christine? She's gone. Gone? I cried. Yeah, her brother picked her up a few minutes ago. My heart sank in my chest. Without another word, I ran outside and started shouting my daughter's name. I was running down the street searching for my daughter, screaming and crying hysterically. It was no use. She was gone. I spent the next two weeks in bed. The police searched for Christine, but they never found any trace of her. Her picture was in the newspaper, her face was on milk cartons. Everybody was looking for her, but it was as if she had disappeared into thin air. After a while, people lost interest and the search was called off. It remained just another unsolved mystery. Years have passed since then, but the pain in my heart never goes away. Such ordinary things make me feel afraid. Hot, sunny days, dark shadows on grass, and children with red hair and the name Harry. Ooh. Spooky! Oh. Harry is a oh, kidnapper. Good. He's a kidnapper. He's a kidnapper. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I've actually got a... um. Creep of the week that's quite long. Do you want me to go straight in? Go for it. Um, go for it. It's really good. And I read it, I was like, I woke up really early in the morning and I was like, oh, I can't really can't really sleep. And I just happened to click on it and uh we'll call uh the sender I because it's anonymous. Okay. Um Hi, Hans. Ghost story for you. Uh, it's a long one, but should be a good one with plenty of atmosphere. Please keep it anonymous. Thank you. For some context, my fiancé and I have worked in corrections, in brackets, jail, uh, for a number of years. and working at night in large facilities with empty cells where lots of violence and occasionally deaths happen. It's not uncommon to hear things, see things or feel weird things in the night, but that's a story for another time. But more recently, I moved into a similar field omitted due to the type of work it is, which has me working in an extremely remote location for upwards of a month at a time. It's similar to a security job, and with my background, I'm pretty security conscious. Think like international mining camp style living in shipping containers, dirt roads, and very little infrastructure. However, this is on a remote island, a five hour flight from the mainland, Australia. If you need to leave the island for any reason, there are two flights a week. And if for whatever reason, like a medical emergency, you don't leave at that time, you need to be... Uh, and for whatever reason, if you have a medical emergency, you need to be airlifted off, and that can be hours. It's extremely isolated. 
This particular job means I'm part of a small staff, 25 to 30, with roughly 20 of us on the island at one time. The rest of the island is largely deserted, except for the locals that live there. A few shops, government buildings, a small airport, and the facility we work at. The lack of facilities means we get power outages often, as the whole place runs on generators and the fuel has to be shipped in every week, and food is delivered once a week too. The phone reception is extremely unreliable too because of where we are, and therefore we often have no phone, internet or power for periods of time. Consequently, whilst at work, we use radios most of the time and have satellite phones for emergencies. The staff are a group that like a practical joke every now and then. But we did, however, agree as a group early on that while we were at our accommodation, basically a shipping container village, uh, that we would look out for each other and have no funny business as a rule at the accommodation, as we didn't want to increase the stress for anyone in an already difficult environment. And with long shifts, it's our only chance to relax after a long 12 hour day. I'd heard stories of people catching chickens and putting them in people's rooms as a joke, and no way was I taking the risk of someone doing that to me. That doesn't stop the practical jokes at work though. We have dogs and cats that live with us at the accommodation that we've befriended over the last year or so. And, and they sometimes sleep in our rooms and keep us company and keep an eye out for us during the night. We also have local security staff at the accommodation 24 seven. All this to say, it sounds like the perfect setup to a horror movie and you would be right. We start work very early in the morning before the sun is up at 4.30 to 5 a.m. And all the staff drive together in a four-wheel drive with their vehicles up the dirt track to the work site. These dirt tracks are in extremely bad shape, full of potholes and overgrown with trees most of the time. Rain comes along seemingly out of nowhere, making it muddy too, and the cars take an absolute beating going along the state of the roads each day. So the staff decided to stick together in a convoy in case something happens. It wasn't unusual to find a drunk driver that had fallen off their motorbike or something in the dark and, and the wet on our way to work. And with the state of the cars, we didn't want staff getting lost or injured whilst trying to help someone. The roads themselves are flanked by large drops into sharp rock pinnacles. And it was a local joke that if you ever wanted to lose something, you could throw it into the pinnacles and it would never be found again, which from the state of them seemed true. After a few weeks, settling into the job and the location and all the changes, I noticed that whenever I would get into a vehicle to drive it, the rear view mirror would be bent upwards. So it was facing the roof of the car and the side mirrors would be turned in random directions. Thinking this was a prank, I initially thought nothing of it. Like I said, our group liked to have a bit of a laugh with each other and messing with the cars just a bit. You know, moving people's seats all the way or moving their car on them. It wasn't unusual, however, this thing with the mirrors started happening almost every day and it didn't matter which car I got into, it would be the same. Something you should know is I love a ghost story. I love checking things out, going to spooky places and have recently been to the infamous suicide forest in Japan by myself, which is a story for another time. I like exploring supposedly haunted places within reason, of course. So needless to say, it was an interesting conversation I had one day. We work alongside a group of locals born and bred on the island. And one morning I was chatting to a few of them and just randomly mentioned the mirror thing, just sort of making conversation and small talk before having had my coffee. A few of them exchanged hesitant glances. And when I asked what was up, they explained. One of the local staff piped up and said, us locals move the mirrors in the cars and you would be best to as well. So you can't look in on them while on what the What is the mirror moving? Yeah, so, so she's saying when she gets into these cars mm. she's noticed that someone's oh it's pushed, lifted up when she gets been lifted in, up right. and the side mirrors have been pushed right. um <clears throat> one of the local staff piped up and said us locals move the mirrors in the cars and you'd be best to as well so you can't look in them while on the dirt roads i was confused surely that's not safe so i asked why we can't look in the mirrors and they explained you aren't supposed to look in the mirrors when you're driving on the dirt tracks at night and you're never supposed to turn your lights off while you're on that part of the road. I asked again, why? One of them explained, there's a woman. She used to be a maid at the hotel here. She died a long time ago. Some local legends say she lost a baby and she wanders the roads at night looking for her baby, ghostly white and pale. Some people say she killed her baby and threw it into the pinnacle so she wouldn't be caught. But everyone agrees, if you look in your mirror, you will see her. You never look in your mirrors on that road. 
and you never, ever turn your lights off. Or she'll follow you. I do do that sometimes. <clears throat> what? If I'm going down a dirt track just to scare myself. Really? I'll, I'll just turn all my lights off for like one second. It's very, very dangerous. Don't do it, but it is. Fun. Oh my God. Just to, your own spook? Yeah, just a little like, it's like one second to just driving and you're drunk, aren't we? Oh my God. You're braver than I am. I can yeah, do that. I don't know that. why I've done that. I'm a bit weird. Um, we just love a spook, don't we? Okay. Um, yeah. I said, oh, okay. And just sort of laughed it off as a local legend, not really knowing how to answer that professionally. I kept chatting and then promptly forgot about it until that night when I was leaving work with some of the other staff. It was well past dark. The full moon hung low in the sky and we left in our usual convoy. Two four-wheel drive cars following each other, slowly through the twisting, turning dirt roads. Floodlights on, keeping our speed low to avoid potholes and stray dogs and sometimes stray chickens that wander about. I went to adjust my mirror as a reflex and before I did, paused. I thought about what the locals had told me. Then I asked the other staff in the car if they'd heard why our mirrors on our cars keep getting turned around. They all said no, so I relayed what I'd been told early in the morning and giggled at the urban legend, thinking it sounded like every silly legend I'd seen in movies and I was still convinced it was a joke. Liking a bit of a joke myself, I jumped on the radio and told the car behind me that we were slowing down and just to be careful they don't run into us. I came to a stop and turned my mirrors down to the usual positions. I took a glance in them, nothing except my co-workers laughing a bit in the back seat. Then I put my vehicle in park and turned the lights off. Engine's still running. Giggles erupted from the car as we sat for a moment, and we all had a good laugh at the silly story in the darkness. Suddenly, a voice from the car behind us came over the radio. What are you guys doing? Is everything okay? Copy, I replied. All clear, just seeing who's bravest in the car, I replied. A confused, okay, came from the radio. Can we go home now? I don't want to miss dinner. Came through the radio from the car behind us. Sure thing, I replied. I was going to turn the lights back on and take my car out of park when suddenly the engine cut out. My co-workers looked around a bit confused but still laughing and teasing one another, thinking I was still joking around. I looked at my co-worker in the passenger seat and said, the damn cars are in such bad shape. I turned the key and nothing. I tried again, nothing. It wasn't even ticking over. After a few more tries, I got out of the car to walk behind us to talk to the rest of the staff in our other car, leaving my coat. I mean, she, the fact that she's got out of the car is mm. like, I just wouldn't. No. But maybe no it's just a car thing. I don't know. Um, I got out of the car to talk to the rest of the staff in the other car, leaving my co workers in the now broken car. I was standing next to the other car when all of a sudden the engine roared back to life on my car, like someone had held the gas pedal down when starting it. Confused, I walked back, only five to ten paces, figuring my co-workers had kept trying it while I was out of the car, but they were all sitting in their seats, as confused as I was. Oh, good, you got it working, I said, as I jumped back in the driver's seat, speaking to my co-worker in the passenger seat. It wasn't me, he said quietly. I've been sitting here the whole time. Well, I guess the cars have broken down so much, they're spontaneously coming back to life for a change then, I said, teasing. We started driving slowly, and the headlights on my car started to flicker, doesn't surprise me anymore, I said out loud to my co-workers. Teasing, I said, maybe it's the ghost woman coming to get us. Some chuckles came from my co-workers around me and we continued on in relative silence, the faint gurgle of the radio in the background. It's a short drive back to our accommodation, about 20 minutes and we were halfway when the car thing happened, so it wasn't long before we were back. I checked the mirrors a few times along the way, mostly out of driving habit than anything else, and each time there was nothing unusual. Convinced everything was a coincidence, we arrived at our accommodation safely and I began my nightly routine of a workout, dinner, shower, skincare and a video call home to my fiancé. As I said, power outages were common, so before I left, my fiancé gifted me a little battery-powered light to keep in my room so I'd never be in the dark for too long. Cute. It's an orange pumpkin. Oh, that's nice. Because of my love of spooky things and I turn it on most nights through a bit of ambience in my small container ship room. I'd done my night routine and was in my pyjamas on FaceTime to my fiancé talking about the day's events and suddenly the power cut out. All the lights went out except for my little dutiful glowing orange pumpkin. Damn it, I said. Switching from the Wi-Fi onto international roaming in hopes that I could finish my conversation and say goodnight to my fiancé. I waited a few minutes and nothing. No signal, my phone read, where the service indicator usually is. 
Let her outside. Sat on my bed and started writing a now familiar text to my fiance. Hey, not sure when you'll get this, but the power and phone lines are down again. I'm going to bed, but I'll be back. I'll talk to you in the morning. I love you. I press send in hopes that when my phone reconnected, it would go through, as it sometimes does. I was sitting in bed, contemplating listening to a downloaded podcast or movie, reserved for situations like this, to fall asleep to when my pumpkin light started to flicker. I looked at it, and it stopped, glowing its familiar warm amber colour. It was silent all around me. The shipping container rooms are largely soundproof, although we are right next to each other. It's not unusual to hear your neighbour if the door and window is shut, which, due to the extreme constant hot weather outside and the air conditioning inside, mine always is. I pulled my covers back and climbed into bed, fluffing my pillows a little and scrolling through Spotify for something to fall asleep to as I settled. I'd go for rain. Classic. Like the ghost suns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ghost suns and then rain. Um, the pumpkin light flickered again on the shelf next to my front door. This time I got up and walked a few paces towards it, thinking a wire was loose and thinking to myself, I hope the power surge hasn't ruined it, or checking it over. It seemed fine, no signs of any loose wires. It had never done this before in the year I'd had it, but I figured maybe the batteries were dying. They hadn't been replaced since I got it. Just as I turned around to get back into bed, a huge... <laughs> a huge bang, bang, bang came from what sounded like one of my neighbour's rooms outside. It sounded like someone banging on a door. I stood still for a second and rolled up my small window blind, turning my flashlight on my phone to help me see a bit better. Uh, it came from what sounded like one of my neighbour's rooms outside. It sounded like someone banging on a door. I stood still for a second and rolled up my small window blind, turning my flashlight on my phone to help me see a bit better. When I rolled up the blind, I gasped as I saw a woman's face peering back oh, at me through the glass. Gosh. I then breathed a small sigh when I realised it was my own reflection <laughs> looking back at me. Peering out my window, I couldn't see anything except the sleepy security guard outside, scrolling on his phone under an emergency light in relative darkness. I opened my door, keeping the screen door locked, and had another look around expecting to see one of my drunk co-workers stumbling around trying to find his room after a few too many drinks. Nothing. I opened the screen door and popped my head out to see something, but there was nothing. The security guard lifted his head a little in my direction, but he stayed mostly focused on his phone. The dim light illuminated above him. I noticed one of the familiar cats sat a few paces away from my room peering at me. He was all black with big eyes and I had lovingly nicknamed him Salem. He would visit my room often for food and occasionally be brave enough to come inside and share my dinner with me and escape the heat outside. I closed the door and walked back to bed. Louder. Again. It was closer. I flung, my, um, I flung open my door again, ready to yell at one of my drunken co-workers to go to bed, and again, nothing. I stopped and looked at the undisturbed security guard. I said, look, hey, did you see anyone around here? I heard banging, I explained. No, he said and he put his head back down to continue scrolling. I was shaking my head and turning to once again to get back into bed when again, bang, 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 right on my door. It was so loud, echoing through my room that I jumped. And as a reflex from my training, I held myself against the door with all my weight, shoulder pressed against the door to stop it from shaking and hands on the door handle. When it stopped, I stood frozen for what felt like an eternity, although I'm sure it was only a few seconds. There is no interior lock on these doors, but you do need a programmed key card to access them, similar to hotel doors. They only have keyholes for emergencies like fires, which our administration office carry, that are held in a locked office. So I wasn't particularly worried about anyone being able to get in, but it was freaking me out now. Who's there? I boomed, putting on my best intimidating jail officer voice. The one I used to use when inmates would disobey the rules and be rude to staff. Silence. This is a prank, I don't appreciate it. Go to bed. I boomed again, more silence. Still holding myself against the door, I waited for something, anything, any reply, nothing. After another eternity, I slowly opened the door again to silence. The security guard looked up at me this time. You okay? He asked. Did you not see someone banging on my door? No. It was so loud, it echoed in here. You must have seen someone, I exclaimed, getting worked up. No one around but us, miss, he insisted. I think someone's pranking me and they know that's not allowed, I said loudly, hoping whoever it was would hear me and show themselves. Silence came from the darkness around. I stood there expectantly, but still nothing. I took one more look at the security guard. 
With my phone in my hand, I checked it again, still showing no service. I turned the flashlight on, hoping it would make me feel a bit better, and turned around, closing the door behind me. As I turned and my flashlight danced across the walls, I saw a flicker of something flash past my eyes. I blinked a few times and looked around the dimly lit space. My first thought that it must have been a cockroach or maybe Salem the cat had run into my room. I looked around again. I was equally scared and curious, but there was nothing. Except I noticed my bathroom door was open ever so slightly. I must have forgotten to close it, which wasn't unusual. I stood with my back to the front door, remembering every horror movie trope I'd ever seen. Never split up from the group, never say I'll be back, never go upstairs when you could go out the front door, never investigate the strange noise, never read from the obviously haunted book or play Bloody Mary at a sleepover. Well, we've flaunted all of those. Oh, yes. I used to joke about following these rules with my friends and boasted that I'd always be smart enough to, be the, to make it to be the final girl status in a horror movie, should they be real. I stood frozen in place as the sound of my shower running slowly started. Oh. I stood frozen in place as the sound of my shower running slowly started from the other side of the door. I couldn't move. I stood frozen. When the adrenaline finally kicked in, I turned and ran outside my room, flinging the doors open so hard they hit the outside of the building with a bang. The security guard stood up this time. What's wrong? He said. I think there's someone in my room, I blurted out. I backed up and we stood under the emergency light for a few moments, staring at my wide open front door, the dim orange light spilling out onto the concrete. Only one door in and one door out, miss, and no one's been past me except you, he said. I gave him a look that must have showed how scared I was, because after a moment he followed up with a, do you want me to have a look? Yeah, I said meekly. The adrenaline wearing off and embarrassment starting to take over. The security guard took a few steps towards my room, pausing before he entered to exclaim, Hello? Is anyone in there? Uh, <laughs> with a level of gusto. <laughs> That's not how I did it. Uh, hello? <laughs> anyone in here? With a, the level of gusto that indicated he wasn't really invested in my story. The shower came on by itself, I said loudly to him. He nodded silently and took a step inside cautiously. Hello? He said again. No reply. If anyone's in here, I'm giving you one final warning to come out. As he finished his sentence, my room and the surrounding walkways outside flickered and lit up like a Christmas tree. Warm yellow lights beamed from all around us and I heard the faint sputter of a generator in the distance. The power was back. Finally, I breathed a small sigh of relief. With the security guard still at the doorway to my room, my phone lit up with messages. Babe, I thought I saw something weird on the video. Are you okay? I'm guessing the service has dropped. I can't get through, one message read. Babe, seriously, I'm not being funny. Are you there? The next one said, please call me as soon as you get service. I'm really worried. Jaw slightly agape, I just stared at the messages and back at the security guard entering my room. He was now inside and reached the bathroom door. The sound of running water echoing. He flung it open and stepped back, revealing nothing. The bathroom was empty. He took a look under my bed, over the cupboards to reveal nothing and came back outside declaring proudly, no one in there, miss. The shower must have just turned on because of the power surge or something. I could tell he had declared it a case closed and hesitantly I walked back inside my room, the adrenaline wearing off. I called my fiance, putting him on FaceTime and propping my phone up to continue our conversation. I'm sorry, the power went out. No, it's fine, are you all right? I'm fine, I just had a weird night, that's all, I explained. I got a bit freaked out in the dark by myself, but luckily I had the light you gave me. And even I got the security guard to check my room, I was so freaked out, I one too many movies, I think. Well, that's what it's there for. Must be the night for it, though. Yeah, maybe it's the full moon or something. I'm sure, I said. You don't have to remind me. <laughs> don't, don't remind me about that full moon. Um, I picked up my phone and propped it up in the bathroom. As I turned the tap on to run the hot water, I began to rinse my face, my eyes closed, and I was spending a bit more time than usual, trying to relax and taking some deep breaths, letting the steam fill my tiny bathroom while my fiancé chatted away in the background. A minute or so later, I stood up, wiped the excess water from my eyes and glanced at my phone. My fiancé was still on FaceTime talking and I smiled back at him. Hold on a sec, I'm just going to dry my face, I can't see very well, he said, blinking furiously to keep droplets out my eyes. I leant over and dried my face with my towel and looked up, steam still filling half of my tiny bathroom. Mm -mm. As I looked up, I was once again frozen, mouth slightly ajar, breath quickening. 
my fiance stopped talking and asked, what's wrong? But all I could do was stare. In the foggy mirror was a handprint, clear as day, wiped along my bathroom mirror and a question that looked like it had been written messily with someone's finger in the steam that sent chills down my spine. Where's my baby? The end! What is the baby thing? Do you remember the woman who was like, they say, the locals say there's a woman. Oh, the legend of the yes, latest. Yes, As soon as there's a handprint smeared across glass, it just reminds me of Titanic and when they all got sex. Oh, I know. Yeah, it was Kate Winslet. Well, thank you, Anonymous. That was lovely. It's a, it was a longy, but a creepy. Well, it doesn't matter. As long as it's scary, we'll take it. Okay. Love that. I've got a very short one. Go on, then. There was a teacher who had exactly 30 students in his class. He had a reputation for being very cruel and strict. Sometimes when his students misbehaved, he made them stay back and study until late at night in the library. That sounds illegal. <laughs> in order to make sure his students actually stayed there and didn't sneak off or go to sleep, he gave them his cell phone number and instructed them to call him at certain times during the night and tell them their student number. That is... Mm. Nazi. Yeah. What? So is hang on. Is he saying that? Oh right. So he'd he'd make them call him to so that they knew he was still there. Okay. This went on for a while, but one night he received a strange call. He answered as usual, and heard a girl's voice mumbling, "Hi, teacher. I'm number thirty-one." Before he could say anything, she abruptly hung up on him. At first, he didn't even realise, but then he felt furious as he thought of one of his students was playing a joke on him and taking him for a fool. The next day, he stormed into the classroom and demanded that the student who pulled the prank stand up and take responsibility for it. The classroom went silent and no one stood up. All of the students denied knowing anything about it. He threatened the whole class, telling them he would beat them if it happened again that night. Oh, again, quite illegal. Unexpectedly, it did happen again. At exactly the same time, he received another phone call. Again, it was the same girl's voice, and she said, Hi, teacher. I'm number 31. He tried to ask the girl to tell him her name, but she hung up before he got the chance to open his mouth. The next day, he made good on his threats and beat the students in the classroom one by one. Is this like the 1960s I or something? I think it is, yeah. Like with a fucking... What's he called? Uh, the cane. The cane. But, they, but then there are these mobile numbers, so what's going oh, on? Oh, yeah. You know? It's just That's fucking Samsung's illegal. Back then. The next day, he made good on his threats and beat the students in the classroom one by one, demanding that someone own up. Of course, no one did. He even went as far, so far as to go to the other classes and ask them about it, but no one would admit to anything. The calls continued every night exactly the same way. The teacher was going out of his mind. Then finally, one night, before the girl hung up, he managed to ask, Who are you? In a weak voice, the girl replied, I'm in your class, teacher. You know me. My class only has 30 students. Stop trying to trick me. The girl just said, I'm always watching you during class, teacher. But you always turn your back on me. I want to see your face. Then once again, she abruptly cut off the call. The teacher changed his behaviour. He told his students he wasn't going to make anyone stay back after class anymore. He even went so far as to change his cell phone number, but the calls continued. Eventually, the teacher couldn't take it anymore. The calls were driving him insane. He retired shortly afterwards. A few months later, the student, the school underwent renovations, and while the builders were replacing the blackboard in the teacher's classroom, they were shocked by what they discovered. Hidden in the wall behind the blackboard was the dead body of a young girl. Oh, of course there was. He definitely killed her. He is a bad man. Oh, do you think? Yeah, he sounds like a cunt. Yeah, Sorry, Mum. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. He sounds like a bastard. Oh, no. He... I absolutely hate teachers. I mean, like, I'm sure there's some of... No, I should take that back, really, because I know some of them are really nice, but I used to know... My physics teacher, like, used to throw people's bags out of windows. Jesus. Like, really bad. Yeah, and this one kid, um, I mean, he was a bit like... He was a bit of a... He was a bit of a lad, 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 and came in wearing a school cap and told everyone he was Jewish. And of course, <laughs> no one can then because he knew, like he was very into, he knew that if he did that, nobody could kind of question him on it. Right. But everybody knew he was taking the piss, and the teachers were like, "You're taking the piss," but there's nothing we can do about yeah. it. And one day, what did he, I think he like the teacher like grabbed his school cap off, cap off him and threw it out the window. Oh my god! Well, yeah. 
Do you know what though? I, that I can't now. imagine being a fucking teacher and being wound up just... so much by these little shit. No, I was. Well, I'd I probably just... choose violence. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't blame this guy. Actually, fine. Yeah, whatever. They, like beat the shit out of yeah. them. Yeah. Like they're being annoying little pricks. Yeah. Well, they were like they're not. They're not like these aren't vulnerable mother children, so they are vulnerable. <laughs> but I do remember how much of a little shit I was and everybody in my class was Yeah, in school. I know. There was a teacher I think we made cry. I didn't personally, but, like, she she ended up losing the fucking plot. She, like, ran out crying. Yeah. Just because when someone starts a joke and then you kind of carry it on and it's, it's like... It's at an age where you think, you think something's <sighs> really funny. Yeah. And it's not like you're taking the piss out of the person. It's that that thing is really funny. Yeah. But... They they just can't. We've had like three paedophiles out at our school. Jesus, was it three? Am I making that up? Three. There's definitely one. They're not clearly vetting any of these I'll fucking. Ta- no, teachers I'll tell you then. what it was. No, no, no. It was one at the high school, and then I think it was a bloke who ran the news agents opposite my primary school. Oh shit! So I think there was like one, but one that was kind of related to school, and then. <gasps> Oh, so you had a high school was one? Was there a PE teacher? Yeah, it was a high school did you, one. Did you get taught by them? Yeah, well, yeah, he was kind of like, he was It was really creepy because he was one of those that just seemed so, like, innocent. Yeah, they always and do. They oh, always he was, do. Oh, he was like, he was really, like, spotty, like a te- he looked like uh. a teenager. It was a real creepy. But yeah, he went to prison. Really? Yeah. But we've, we always took the piss out of him. But oh, fucking... I'll, 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 anyway, what, for being a pedo or just taking the <laughs> piss? Oh, you call every teacher a pedo, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> and he's like, you call little do every you know? Single thing. But don't you think it's weird? Shit. Like in PE, you were meant to shower together. It was all very oh, weird. And I'm wearing those fucking leotards. Wearing them shorts and leotards. Yeah. yeah, what was that about? No, just fucking cover us up and don't make us. And like exercise. you weren't allowed to wear anything else. Yeah, yeah, and Jogging my leotard bottoms. had to come from a little fucking box. A box. Yeah, that stank of bo. What oh, do you mean? Was, was it lost property? Yeah, it was like it was basically like if you forgot your PE kit, oh, yeah. then you'd be like, "We'll get into the box." I was just on my period every week. Oh god! I just did it every time, and I was like, "I've got problems with my ovaries." Yeah, yeah when somebody yeah. Be like, "You only have a period once a month," and I'm like, "Not me! I've got loads of ovaries." Yeah, I'm bleeding every day. I'm me. absolutely packed full of ovaries, <laughs> and th- one of them is ovulating. The first day of school is always nerve-wracking for any student. My first day at a new school was an absolute nightmare. I was 14 years old and my family had just moved to a new town. We'd moved home and my dad had been offered a job with better pay and a mere week later we'd sold our house and rented an apartment in the town we'd moved to. It was during the summer we moved, so I don't think anyone's ever said moved so much in one sentence. It was during the summer we moved, so it was simple starting my new school. On the first day I walked alone. I was nervous about having to make new friends, but when I arrived, I picked up my timetable and saw that my first class was mathematics. Fucking hell. No. That is rough. It was in room 104. I began walking down the hallway searching for the room, but the school was like a maze. Eventually, the bell rang and the students made their way to their classrooms. In less than a minute, the corridors were deserted. I stopped in front of a pair of old-looking wooden doors, so I pushed them open with a scraping sound of metal on wood, and they opened. I found myself in a corridor that was old and dusty. The lockers were all hanging open and the stench of mould and damp hung in the air. I was about to turn around and go back, but then I noticed numbers and saw 100, 101, 102. I began walking down the hallway, but when I peered through the windows of each classroom, they were empty. Then I came to room 104. I peeked through the window. All of the students were sitting at their desks. The teacher was standing at the blackboard and the class was in session. I quietly opened the door and went inside. None of the other students paid any attention to me. I started to apologise awkwardly for being late, but the teacher just turned her back on me and began writing on the board. Turning red for embarrassment, I hurriedly found a free seat at the front of the classroom and sat down. The teacher had already written her name in chalk on the blackboard. It was Miss Taylor. I was nervous and self-conscious, so I didn't want to draw attention to myself. Throughout the class, I just kept my head down and concentrated on solving the math problems. Eventually, after what seemed like hours, the bell rang and the class ended. The other students scrambled out of their desks and ran out of the door. I looked at my watch and I was shocked to see that it was already 3pm. The school day was over and I'd only attended one class. I walked down the corridors trying to find the exit and all of a sudden I heard someone calling my name. I looked around and there was a teacher making his way towards me and he had a frown on his face. You, you're the new boy, aren't you? He said. Uh, yeah, I replied. Where have you been? He demanded. I've been searching for you all day. Why didn't you go to your classes? But I was in class. Which class? He demanded. Miss Taylor's room 104. The teacher's eyes grew wide and he flew into a rage. I suppose you think you're pretty funny, don't you? Well, you're not. It's no laughing matter. Now get out of my sight. Wow. 
I was very confused and on the long walk home, I kept wondering what I'd said that had got him so upset. As soon as I reached my house, I turned on my laptop and went online and went searching for the school, for the name of the school and the teacher, Mrs. Taylor. And what I found scared me to my very soul. There were all news articles about a terrible massacre. Fuck, this is dark. But it happened in the school 10 years before. Uh, there were pictures of the classroom where the murders had happened and I recognised it immediately. It was room 104. There were also photos of the victim, victims and I recognised them too. Trembling with fear, I gazed at the smiling faces of Miss Taylor and all the students I'd been in class with that very day. My hands were shaking and a chill ran through me. I spent all night trying to convince myself that it wasn't true. The next morning, I was too terrified to go back to school. I broke down and told my parents what had happened. At first, they thought it was just nerves, but like, since when has that ever happened? But eventually, after I'd refused to go to school for a whole week, they gave in and enrolled me in a different one. I managed to get on with my life and tried my best to forget all about the incident. But this morning, I received a letter. There was no stamp and no return address. It had been hand-delivered. When I opened it and read the printed card inside, my hands started shaking again. It was an invitation to a class reunion, and it was signed, Miss Taylor. No, no. I would go. I would go. Would you? Yeah, I'd take someone and I'd go. It's so like the ghosty reunion. Well, I'd just have to see what was going on. Yeah. I absolutely would have there to. There is a part two, I reckon, there. Mm. Something's going on. <laughs> Let's go. Ghost reunion sounds like a Goosebumps book. Yeah. <laughs> I miss yeah. the Goosebumps, actually. We should bring those back. I know. They were good. I liked those. Going on my own little yeah, ghostly journey. Yeah, guys, let us know if that's a thing, thing you want. Okay, um, do you want a little Go ahead. My wife keeps introducing me to people who aren't there. I thought she was playing a practical joke the first time she did it. I was in the kitchen when she walked in the front door mid-conversation. She gave a brief pause and introduced me to no one, apparently called Jeff. I gave her a quizzical glance, but she carried on the conversation, going as far to pause as if waiting for the other person to reply. <coughs> really, Ian? You can't say hello? There's no one there, I cried. We didn't talk for a few days, and then on the weekend she asked if I wanted to go have some drinks with some friends. I was still cranky, but I agreed. She was my wife. We arrived to an empty apartment. She told me not to bother knocking. My wife smiled as she let herself into the apartment. Said she'd never hear us knocking over all the chatter. My heart began to race as I watched my wife lean down, hugging people who were not there. She gave names. Um, she gave names of who was sitting in each empty chair. I stared around the empty room, dazed. I gingerly took a seat in what I was hoping was an empty chair, you know what I mean, and tried to play along with my wife. It happened again the next week. At an art gallery, her friend's exhibition. I started to lose my shit when I was stood in an empty gallery looking at empty picture frames. When I heard my wife ooh and ah over a fucking empty frame, I couldn't contain myself any longer. What the hell's got into you? She hissed. I played along at the start, but this, this is a joke. There's no one in the fucking room face changed to worry I haven't been playing any practical joke on you I swear I think I think you need to go to the doctor my wife wouldn't, wouldn't let up about me seeing a doctor so I gave in I found myself sitting in an empty doctor's office my wife nodding along to an empty office chair a week or so later I arrived home to my wife preparing dinner in our kitchen she gave me a sheepish smile a kiss on my cheek and told me she was sorry for messing with me she was my wife and I loved her well, so she, she was t dicking around. Apparently. It's a big prank. Chris was one of my college buddies. We had recently reconnected, and he invited me and the wife over for dinner. I greeted Chris and introduced him to my wife. We made some small talk. My wife was reserved, and I tried to include her more in the conversation. After a while, Chris gave a nervous laugh and... Chris gave a nervous laugh and asked if everything was okay. He looked awkward, his eyes not quite meeting mine. Um... It's just that there's no one there. My wife tells me she's real. I can feel the warmth of her skin against mine. She's my wife. I believe her. Oh, what's happening there? I don't know. <laughs> what's happening? It's like a very toxic marriage, trying to prank each so other. So he, has he just health. like got a fake? What has he got? A fake ghost wife? But his fake ghost wife is introducing him to fake ghosts. I don't understand. Sometimes our brains Aww. don't understand things. Oh, well, you, well, I'm sure some people will tell us exactly what they think. 
Um, <laughs> would you like to do a we get haunted so you don't have yes, to? Yes, of course. Okay, this is another way of trying to contact the dead. You have to be very focused. Yes. I'm going to do a little, I'm going to do the normal chant, right? Yes. And you need to, well, I'm going to do the little chant in the background. It's like we're starting a cult, which I love. Um, I'll really, on a bit of an off note, my mate I spoke to last night, she was like, yeah, 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 I, um, you know, I was, I, she's moved to a new place and uh, she, she doesn't really know anyone there. She was like, yeah, I did have a look and see, like, if I could join a cult, actually, and it seems quite reasonable. And I was like, you okay? What do you mean? And she what, was like, what well, she said, well, at first I was just looking at communes and then I saw a cult and then I found myself reading it and was like, actually, no, this is mental. And I was like, I'm glad. Wow, you can you just find that. a cult that easily, Online, can you? Google it, honestly, just really? like, yeah, they've got their own little ad well that what's that thing what was that thing called about that dating thing where they oh, twin flames yeah that's still going that's mad you can google but it the thing is they don't no no cult ever says it's a cult they always say I think this one did this one's like oh listen this one we're did. gonna be straight well she said up. that's where she ended up on it but who knows wow. um where's the little did you mate show? um uh ever get ever go on that date with that guy she gave her number to no Oh. I know. Well, I think she woke up the next day thinking, what the fuck was I thinking? Oh, Because we, we were all quite pissed. Yeah, fair. We fair, were all quite fair. drunk. Uh, very good day, though. My birthday. Where is this fucking chat? Okay. So the, 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 there is a belief that um, there is a way of contacting the dead via knocking. So what I want oh. you to do is ask the question for us, but then, like, knock out the syllables straight after. So, like... Um, Morse code. Okay. And then you will get a response via knocking. Okay. Maybe from the wall, from the door, from under the table. Knocking shop. Okay. Knocking shop, yeah. So I'm going to start the chant. And then you, when I'm chanting, I'm just going to chant over and over again. Yeah. And you need to do your question. So if you're like, what is your name? And then go. Okay, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Hear these words. Okay, that's more of a song, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you're, oh, you're, can't you're help rapping. It. It's spoken word and it's giving me the it. <laughs> Come to me, summon thee, cross now to the great effect. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay, fine, I'll do it. No. Hear these words, make me cry, spirit from your own soul. You need to ask your question. Oh, okay. You can do it in a normal okay. voice. Um, spirit from the other side. Is it quite distracting me too much? Come to me, summon thee. I've done it. Should I do it again? Do it again. Hear these words. Cry. <laughs> Spirit from the others. Oh, you got a response. No, you just knocked under the table. I and actually, it, we yes. don't appreciate no. lies. Susie didn't even fucking flinch then. I think it's become... Just... Okay, well, that didn't work, but never mind. Wait, let's hear. I maybe, reckon... Maybe one of our listeners... Fuck <laughs> me! Oh, my God, that was... Oh I'm sorry, God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You little bastard wank stains. <laughs> and on International <laughs> Women's Day. Oh, on International hell. Women's Day. How dare you. Fucking hell. Oh, my Jesus Christ. Oh, for, well, for all our listeners, um, that was Tim in the, um, in the editor's suite scaring the shit out of us. Knocking one off. Knocking one off. <laughs> but listen, this has been stunning. Thank you so much. Happy 70. Go, if, I mean, who knows at this point if there are tickets left, even if we're doing shows. I mean, there will be a show for you to go and buy tickets to, so please go and do that. And if you can't get enough, go on over to patreon.com slash ghost hunts. Yes. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.